Larynx is a short tube that connects laryngopharynx, which is supposed to be here, to trachea, which is connected to the lower part of larynx. It sits in the midline of the neck, extending in front of the cervical vertebral bones C4, C5, and C6, and behind larynx we can find esophagus. We have nine pieces of cartilages in larynx, which I start with the largest one, that is the thyroid cartilage, or Adam's apple. This is one large piece of hyaline cartilage. Um, obviously, both male and female do have the thyroid cartilage. However, in male, we know that the testosterone hormone is going to impact the growth of thyroid cartilage and make it more prominent. I can see that the thyroid cartilage is connected to this U-shaped bone that is called hyoid bone by some ligaments. We name these ligaments that connect thyroid cartilage to hyoid bone, thyrohyoid membrane or thyrohyoid ligament. And also we notice that thyroid cartilage is connected to the most inferior cartilage in larynx, which is called crocoid. Crocoid is a strong hyaline cartilage. It looks like a ring. And we do have several membranes that connect the thyroid cartilage to crocoid cartilage. And we name these membranes cricothyroid membrane. And right now I want you to pay attention to the cricothyroid membrane that I'm pointing at exactly in front of larynx connecting thyroid cartilage to crocoid cartilage because that's a very important landmark for us. First of all, on the neck of an individual, we can actually palpate these cartilages. We can palpate where thyroid cartilage ends and where crocoid cartilage starts. And that would be exactly the place that when tracheostomy is not possible, recall tracheostomy is a procedure that we do on the actual trachea. And when I say we, it simply means that a surgeon in the operating room of a hospital setting opens a window, a hole in front of trachea and then insert a tube into the trachea. However, sometimes due to time restriction, due to not being in the hospital setting, lack of equipment, we cannot do the tracheostomy. So in those situations, when we have an obstruction in the airways, the patient does not get, it does not get air in and out of the lungs, our next option would be cutting a little bit of the cricothyroid membrane, which is exactly between crocoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage, and then inserting a tube directly into the larynx. And that's what the health professionals do at the scene. So before transporting the patient to the hospital, clearly, sometimes we need to reestablish the airflow in and out of the lungs. But since tracheostomy has lots of complications and cannot really be done easily outside the hospital setting, the next option would be a procedure that temporarily it opens the airways and allows the air to move in and out until the patient is transported to the hospital and then tracheostomy is done by the surgeon. This procedure that we are opening a hole into larynx exactly at cricothyroid membrane is called cricothyrotomy. So that's the importance of knowing about this important landmark. Then when I follow the crocoid cartilage, I see that crocoid cartilage is connected to the first tracheal cartilage by another membrane, another ligament. That one is called crocotracheal membrane. So that would be the crocotracheal membrane. And then before I show you the other seven pieces of cartilage that we have in larynx, I would like you to pay attention to the location of thyroid gland, even though in this model um, it's not highly accurate. However, it shows that thyroid gland covers the lateral side of thyroid cartilage, covers a significant portion of the lateral side of crocoid cartilage. It covers crocoid cartilage anteriorly. And then exactly the part of thyroid gland that connects the right and left side together, we call that the isthmus of thyroid. Uh, that could uh, basically cover part of crocoid cartilage and also it could cover some of these tracheal cartilages. The reason that I would like you to pay attention to the location of thyroid gland is mostly because in 
Either one of the procedures, doesn't matter if we are opening a hole into larynx or opening a hole into trachea, we should not damage the thyroid gland or the major blood vessels that we have in this spot or the major uh, important muscles that we have in this area. Recall that we have the infrahyoid muscles in this section plus some other muscles such as platysma. So now that I found the thyroid cartilage and crocoid cartilage, to locate the other cartilages of larynx, I take a look at the posterior view of larynx and uh, immediately I note that that leaf-shaped structure over there, that's epiglottis. However, it is covered by mucous membrane. So when I cut an open larynx through mid sagittal section, we have a better view of epiglottis. But for now, I would like you to pay attention to crocoid cartilage and then we see that above crocoid cartilage on the posterior side, we have two cartilages that we refer to them as arytenoid cartilages. Uh, I can see the left arytenoid cartilage. The right one is covered by muscles, but we have a right one. Arytenoid cartilages are hyaline cartilages, and they do have synovial joint with crocoid cartilage. That allows the arytenoid cartilages to have a wide range of movement. And as soon as we look at the mid-sagittal view of larynx, you note that arytenoid cartilages are connected to the vocal folds, those structures that we use as principal structures to produce sound. When this laryngeal muscles contract, if they push the arytenoid cartilages away, we see that the space that we have inside between the uh, vocal folds also expand, opens up. But when laryngeal muscles push these arytenoid cartilages inward, we see that the space that we have inside between the vocal folds also narrows down. So we would say that arytenoid cartilages and their movements have significant role in our voice and sound production. Above arytenoid cartilages, we find two small elastic cartilages. They look like horn. We named these elastic cartilages corniculate cartilages and also the movement of corniculate cartilages affect sound production. And then from corniculate cartilages, I move anteriorly toward epiglottis. And even though I do not see the cuneiform cartilages, but I see two little bumps here. Um, the mucous membrane right now uh, doesn't let us to see the actual cartilage, but exactly in these two little bumps, we have two small elastic cartilages. They have club shape and uh, we call them cuneiform cartilages. Cuneiform cartilages support the corniculate cartilages. Also cuneiform cartilages support the lateral side of epiglottis. So to clarify, let me open the larynx through mid sagittal view. And quickly, we go through these cartilages together. I can see the thyroid cartilage. I see that through thyrohyoid membrane, it is connected to hyoid bone. And I see that also hyoid bone through some ligaments is connected to epiglottis. So that's epiglottis. The stem of epiglottis is connected by some ligaments to the inside of thyroid cartilage. The upper part of epiglottis, uh, which look like a leaf, that actually is free. And the upper part of epiglottis can move up and down, which is necessary during swallowing. When a mass of food and drink gets into laryngopharynx, which would be this space, exactly at that moment, pharynx and larynx both move up. Moving pharynx up opens up the space to allow food and drink to get in. But when larynx moves up, it allows epiglottis to move down like this and close larynx. And as you see, the moment epiglottis moves down, I can see cuneiform is supporting it. It's like a stand over there that is supporting epiglottis. As soon as food and drink gets into esophagus, which is behind larynx, then epiglottis uses its elasticity because it's elastic cartilage and moves back up and opens larynx. So that would be the movement of epiglottis. And now it makes sense why epiglottis is elastic cartilage, 
Also recall that cuneiform and corniculate, they also are elastic cartilages. However, arytenoid, crocoid, and thyroid cartilage, these are all hyaline cartilages. Next, I go inside the space that we have inside the larynx, which we call that laryngeal cavity. And I notice that it's lined by mucous membrane. And uh, the mucous membrane on the lateral wall of larynx creates two pairs of folds. The upper fold is called vestibular fold. Right now, I'm pointing at the left vestibular fold. If you bring your left and right vestibular folds together, close together, you can close this area. That's what we do, for example, when we are picking up, lifting a heavy object or when you voluntarily want to hold your breath. So we do not use vestibular folds in generating sound. We just use them to hold our breath, which is a very important role. The lower fold, which is much larger, is called vocal fold or true vocal cords. If we go deep inside the vocal folds, we notice we have lots of elastic ligaments extending through the vocal folds. And as you see, the vocal folds are connected to some muscles and also cartilages, such as arytenoid cartilages. That's why I explained that the movement of, for example, arytenoid cartilage can easily change how much space we have between the right and left vocal folds. Now, these laryngeal muscles that we see here, when they contract, they can change the tension that we have in the vocal fold. Imagine the muscles contract and start pulling those elastic ligaments that we have in the vocal fold. At that moment that these elastic ligaments are tight, when we push air through them, they vibrate rapidly. And that would lead to generating a high pitch sound. However, if the muscles do not pull these uh, elastic ligaments and they are somehow loose, at that moment when we push air through them, their vibration is happening more slowly and that would lead to generating a lower pitch sound. So in general, the pitch of the sound depends on how tight or loose the elastic ligaments in the vocal folds are which that depends on the contraction and relaxation of some of the laryngeal muscles. However, the loudness of sound depends on the pressure of the air. If you push more volume of air, higher pressure air, obviously sound that you generate would be louder. Please keep in mind that vocal folds are the principal structures that we use to generate sound. However, the upper airways, such as pharynx, mouth, nasal cavities, paranasal sinuses all have a role in resonating, amplifying the sound and giving it that human characteristic so other people can recognize our voice. Each one of us has a unique voice. The next thing that I would like to mention is that when we go through the laryngeal cavity, which is the space inside larynx, we name the part of this space which is above the vocal folds um, laryngeal vestibule, and we name the part of this space that is below the vocal folds infraglottis uh, cavity. And when we focus on the mucous membrane that lines the laryngeal vestibule versus the infraglottis uh, cavity, we notice that the epithelial tissue in the mucous membrane is different. The epithelial tissue that we have in lining the upper part is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Having multiple layer epithelium should make sense here because, for example, we experience some friction, let's say due to the movement of epiglottis. However, when we go below the vocal folds, then the epithelial tissue of mucous membrane is ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Clearly here we need secretion of mucus from goblet cells because we need mucus for conditioning the air. Any inflammation in the mucous membrane of larynx, which is referred to as laryngitis, and it could be due to irritant or uh, an infectious disease, can easily change the tension in the vocal folds 
and as a result lead to hoarseness or even loss of the voice. And that explains why, for example, in long-term smokers, because we have a chronic inflammation, their voice changes over time and that hoarseness is going to happen. Um, but in general, we have to take this seriously. When the voice changes, that's an indication that we have some sort of edema, which is a sign of inflammation in the area. And we need to do some tests to find out what is the cause of that inflammation and do the best, follow the treatment plan or the procedure that is required to basically uh, reduce the inflammation. And then in this view, last but not least, I would like you to pay attention one more time to cricothyroid membrane. That's the membrane that we penetrate. If my pen is, for example, a tube, that's exactly where we insert the tube into larynx. And usually those tubes are flexible, so they can actually a little bit extend down into trachea also. But that's the spot for uh, cricothyroid. Thy thyrotomy that I explained.